We started this series last week, just a three-week series called Blast Off, Challenging or Faith Unleashed in the New Year, Challenging Our Faith in the New Year. And uh, last week we, we talked about, before, before we can even begin to, to do anything with our faith really, we need the Holy Spirit. We need to add water. They're, they're, we, we are like instant mashed potato flakes or Alka-Seltzer. They're really meant to, to the way that they f- best fulfill their purpose is by adding water. And so we need the Holy Spirit. And if you want to learn more about that, you can come on Wednesday nights. There is a, uh, a, probably a photo floating around somewhere of me wrapped up in a com- comforter while teaching on Wednesday night. So uh, if you want to find out more about what that's about, you can come on Wednesday nights the next couple weeks. We dig deeper into um, what the Holy Spirit, who the Holy Spirit is and what He's about and how He helps us and how we can have access to Him. Um, so we talked about the Holy Spirit last week. This week, I want to talk with you about what God wants to do in you when you invite the Holy Spirit, or through you, when you invite the Holy Spirit to live in you. And I had John read us this parable, which is sometimes called the parable of the talents, or the parable of the servants. Um, but, but I want to just start with this, with this statement. Your, your assumptions are costing you. See, the Master has given us things, and we make assumptions about our ability to use those things, um, the urgency with which we need to use those things, how, how we ought to go about using those things. We make assumptions about those things. And Jesus challenges the assumptions that people make about what He has or hasn't given them. And so I want to say your assumptions are costing you. I want to ask you to think about what assumptions are you making and how are they costing you in the new year? What assumptions are you making and how are they, they, have you been making in 2017 that may cost you this year unless you challenge and confront those assumptions. Now, don't get me wrong, certain assumptions are necessary. Not all assumptions are bad, right? Certain assumptions are necessary. You can't really ask every pilot of every plane you fly on for his credentials. You're just assuming that he's qualified, that he's confident, that he's going to get you off the ground and back on the ground safely, that the airline has done proper and due diligence in making sure that he's qualified. So you are assuming that they've done that. You have to assume they're licensed and competent. I doubt, maybe some of you do, I don't know, but I doubt you checked the seat that you're sitting in right now before you sat down to make sure it was going to hold weight. You just assume that's a chair, pastor and the leadership and the caretakers of the church have my best interests in mind, and so they surely they would not leave a chair in the sanctuary that is going to give out on me and not only embarrass me, but possibly hurt me as well, right? So you assume, you make, you make assumptions all the time, so not all assumptions are bad, and some of them are necessary for just life expediency. You can't really go around worrying about and checking every single little thing. You have to make some assumptions. Nonetheless, I would say that three of the most dangerous words you can utter when evalu- evaluating a situation or giving an explanation about something are, I just assumed. Those are dangerous words. I just assumed. I didn't prepare, I just assumed. I just assumed that people would understand what I was saying, that that God, (laughs) I've heard pastors say this, I just get in the pulpit, and listen, the Holy Spirit can do that, but God honors preparation too. We can't just assume that you can stand up there and speak a word from God without spending any time studying and knowing His word, without spending any time before Him in prayer and preparation. It, I didn't prepare, I just assumed. If I did that every week, uh, I probably wouldn't go very well at my two-year review. So, uh, I prepare. <laughs> I didn't look into it, I just assumed. I didn't look into it, I just assumed that what I thought about your motive, what, what, the reason that you did that, I just assumed. I didn't look into it, I just assumed. Those are dangerous words. Assumptions can cause personal frustration when you make some assumptions about what someone thinks about you, and you never talk to them to find, about what they, find out what they really feel or what was really meant by the gesture or the thing that they did or didn't do. They didn't look at you. They didn't wave at you, whatever. They didn't smile at you. And you could needlessly grow bitterness and hatred in your heart all because you just assumed. These these little things, you can just just assume things and and these little things can become huge in your heart, right? Mountains out of molehills. My mom used to say, boys, stop making mountains out of molehills. Stop. No, your brother didn't mean that when he said that. No, he, he didn't mean that when, when he took that away from you. He was playing with it and stop making mountains out of molehills. 
we can cause ourselves needless harm because we just assume. Now, Jesus brilliantly confronted the assumptions of his day all the time. And a lot of times, that's what parables were all about. He, you know, we, we talk a lot sometimes about how parables, you know, they're uh, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, and it makes it sound a lot like the main purpose of parables is to be relatable and easy to understand. But Jesus says himself that actually the purpose of a parable is to take the wisdom of the wise and, and, and the things that people assume and think they know and give an alternate view, and only those, who under, only those who have been given understanding by the Holy Spirit will see the hypocrisy and the false perception of their view. That's in Matthew 13. You can read about that. I think in verses 11, 12, 13, and 14, Jesus tells, the disciples ask Jesus, hey, why do you talk in parables? And, and Jesus says, well, because it's a fulfillment of a prophecy. See, there's people who think that they're ever hearing and ever seeing. And they are. They're hearing and seeing, but they're not getting it in their hearts. They're not getting it in their hearts because they think, they've assumed that they understand who God is. They've assumed that they understand what God is like, which people are close to the kingdom of God, and which ones are, are far away. They've assumed that they already understand what it takes to be in right relationship with the Father. I tell you these parables because the knowledge of the kingdom of God has been given to you. I, I tell you, I speak in parables to confound the wisdom of the wise and to reveal the true character and nature of God and what He's like and what kind of people he's after to those to whom have been humble and received the Spirit so that they might understand. To those whom my Father has counted it good to reveal to them. And, and, and Jesus confronted these assumptions of, of these wise people and they killed him for it. They, they were so attached to their false assumptions about what God was like, they hung him on a cross for challenging them. For undermining their illusion of control. And that's all it is. That's, what, that's a big part of what assumptions are about. It's about maintaining an illusion of control subconsciously. So let me give you the anatomy of an assumption before we go on. The anatomy of an assumption. First of all, an assumption may start with apprehension. An assumption may start with apprehension. Because you're scared and uncertain about the unknown, you shield yourself from that fear or that insecurity about what you don't know or what you don't understand. And you create knowledge that you've not taken the time to discover and you've not done the work to discover. Right? It, because you're afraid of the truth, because you're uncertain of the truth, you just assume the truth. And a lot of times, subconsciously, we, as, we assume the truth that's most comfortable to us. A lot of times, the truths we assume, they come from prejudices. Some of them inherited, some of them not. Some of them created by something that somebody did to us that we never, like I said, you never did the work to discover the truth. And so now you already have this false perception of that person. You've already made an assumption about what they're like, and then everything they do from there on out, you continue to make assumptions about. And you're apprehensive about seeking the truth because you don't like facing the uncertainty of what the truth might be. You'd just rather make assumptions, and build your own false world because of your apprehension, all in order to protect us from the uncertainty of the unknown. Second part of an assumption is apathy. I, we don't care enough to find out what it's like to be you. We don't care enough to find out what it, why you did what you did, to, to ask questions that would lead to understanding. We're just, eh, whatever, indifference, apathy. It, 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 and the reason for that is it's a lot easier to assume than to ask. It's a lot easier to assume than to ask. It, it's uncomfortable to ask, right? To go to a person and say, hey, when I saw you the other day, I waved at you and it just seemed like you ignored me and even maybe scowled at me. And it's been eating at me all week. And I know that that sounds crazy, but it, I, just need to, I just need to find out, are we okay? That's awkward, right? But you know what's more awkward? is to go on assuming that that person hates you when maybe they didn't even see you because they were consumed with something going on at home or a conversation or something that they're thinking. How many of you go to the grocery store and really pay attention to every single person around you 100% of the time? I, I cannot tell you how many times people have made assumptions about me as their pastor and how much I care about them as their pastor because I didn't wave at them at the store. I'm not walking around trying to slight you by not waving at you. 
That's, that would be the silliest thing for me to spend my relational change on. Right? So, it's easier to assume than to ask because it's awkward. It's uncomfortable. Maybe we're apprehensive about what we don't know. To ask is to open myself up to the frightening possibility that there might be a view of the world that I did not originate. Right? Subconsciously, that's, we, we don't like to think about things that we don't agree with. <laughs> right? We, it, to ask might mean that somebody would share something with me that doesn't fit my personal worldview. The views that I've spent a lot of time cultivating and forming arguments around and making myself sound really smart about. If I've just spent three months villainizing you, how, un, how, how disconcerting it would be to sit down with you and find out, no, I don't have a problem with you. In fact, I was wondering the same thing. You haven't talked to me in three months. Right? <laughs> Apathy. It's easier to assume than to ask. And thirdly, arrogance. Arrogance. <laughs> Assumptions often come from the idea that the way you've seen the world is the only lens that anyone looks through or has been exposed to or born into. We, we don't mean to. I'm not saying that we all rock, walk around intentionally arrogant. But this idea to think that the, the, the kind of family environment that I grew up in is everybody's reality. The kind of neighborhood and community I grew up in is everybody's reality and everyone should see it my way because we, we make these bold statements like, well, that kid doesn't behave because in my house, if that happened, I would have been beaten to the moon and back. Like, we make assumptions. And that's arrogance to assume that there is one lens by which the whole world ought to see things and do things. So apprehension, apathy, arrogance. Some assumptions don't cost much, but, but when a false assumption and, and, and then we act on a false assumption, that can be scary. When, when we make a false assumption then we act on it, that's when things get really hairy. Some, some assumptions don't cost too much, like, like an assumption that I made several years back on Father's Day. See, in Monette, Missouri, everyone ate at Akambaro, Mexican restaurant. And that, that, that restaurant was right down the road from my house, so it was easy, it was convenient, and it was good food. But across town, there was this other Mexican restaurant, and it was constantly changing names. I, I, like, ownership was changing, names would change, it was always changing. So I never ate at it, because nobody ever went there, and everybody wanted to go to Akambaro. So, but one day, another, I met a new pastor, and he said, uh, we asked, I asked him where he wanted to go, and he said, such, I can't even remember the name because they changed so many times. He said, such and such Mexican restaurant. I said, I'm not familiar with that. And he was like, oh, well, it's this building. I was like, oh, that place. Is that what it's called now? <laughs> good, to, good to know. <laughs> and, and so we went, and they painted new colors on it. It was eye-catching. Like, not only did they change the name, but they changed the paint, and it looked a lot more inviting. And we went in there, and it was amazing. It was better than Akambaro. The meat had full flavor, and the salsa was a little bit spicy, where Akambaro's was kind of weak, and I loved it, and I was so excited because my in-laws were coming over on Father's Day, and I was preaching on that Father's Day, and so they were coming over to worship with us, and my father-in-law called in advance to let me know I could pick the restaurant, which, if you know, if you've heard me talk about my initial relationship with my father-in-law at all, that was like a grail moment for me, like, oh, you know, like, what? I get to be in charge of Father's Day lunch? It felt like a passing of the torch. This, he's giving me his mantle. Wow, this is awesome. I've, I'm in, right? And he loves Mexican food. He, he loved Mexican food with a giant Dr. Pepper. And he really liked Akambaro a lot. He'd eaten there with us several times, and he really liked that place. So I could have played it safe and gone to Akambaro, and known that maybe he would trust me again with such a momentous decision. But I told him, I was like, oh, this is great. i got to introduce you to this other place. I know how much you like Mexican food, and Akambaro is really good, but this other place is awesome. It's, it's like a little piece of Guatemala, because we had, it was run by Guatemalans. We had a lot of Guatemalans in Monet. And, uh, and um, we get there on Sunday after church. I'm flying high from the message. We're having a lot of fun. They brought, their, they brought their son along, too, so my, my brother-in-law's there, Ryan. And uh, we get there, and the name has changed again. Okay? <laughs> no joke. This is like a month after I ate it. 
before. And the name has changed again. And I thought, well, that's odd, but the name's always changing, and, you know, the paint's the same, and it looks like the same people, I think. So uh, I just assumed that the food would be good. It was not. <laughs> it was not good. The uh, meat was cheap and grisly, and half of it just inedible. The salsa was runny, and then it looked like the cilantro had been sitting in it for a couple days. I failed my father-in-law on Father's Day. He passed me the mantle. He gave me the cup, and I failed. And it was all because I made an assumption. <laughs> I made an assumption that because this place finally delivered, it was good. That didn't cost me much, though. I mean, it felt like it in the moment. I was like, oh, this is so embarrassing. We're all like, it became a great big joke. And, you know, if you were to describe my reputation in the family for the first few years, that would basically be it, a great big joke. Um, <laughs> it made a lot of jokes about me. But, so it, was, it felt like a big deal then, but it really didn't cost me that much. Let me tell you about a few, some assumptions you can't afford to make. Then this is just a quick aside. It's just something that I felt like some things that need to be said. Husbands, you can't afford to assume that your wife and kids know that you love them. I don't know who I'm talking to today. I don't know you and your families well enough, so don't think that I've judged your family and decided you need to hear this. I just felt impressed to say this. Husbands, you can't afford to assume that your wife and kids know that you love them. You, you can't just go on saying, well, well I mean, she, she knows. She, she knows. They know. Let me tell you today, tell them again. Show them. Remind them. Convince them. You can't afford to assume that they know that. Tell them again. You can't assume that the people that mean a lot to you know that they mean a lot to you. And I think that's a special... When I wrote that, I didn't know the news that I was going to be sharing with you this morning. You don't know how long you've got with people. You can't assume that people, are, that, that people are, that you think are doing a good job know that they're doing a good job. They may need your encouragement. It may be the, the, the one sentence that gives them the gumption and the unction to continue using the gift that God's given them. They might feel like a failure. They might be feeling worthless in the world. You can't afford to assume that they know they're doing a good job. You can't assume that people that are contributing to your life that you appreciate, you can't assume that they, they know that you appreciate their contribution. This is an important one. A long time ago, uh, a pastor named Kyle Rogers, he preached at camp, and he said, he, he said to all the parents and sponsors in the room, he's talking about sexual purity, and he, he said, parents, have you ever considered that maybe your kids don't know what you think about sexual purity because you've not taken the time to really talk about it, and they don't know why, other than you, you know, you're Christian, that's what Christians believe. Why does it matter to you? What experiences have you had that lead you to continue to believe that? Parents, you can't afford to assume that your kids know what you hope and pray for their lives, hopefully every day, and understand why you hope and pray that. Those are conversations that need to be had. They need, they need to sit down with you and look you in the eyes and hear about mistakes that you made that you hope they don't make. And that, that you pray for them every night and all throughout the day as you think of them. They need to know that. They, they need to know that, that to you these things are not just overbearing things that parents do, but they're, they're ma they were matters of life and death for you. They were matters of going God's way and ending up on a detour that really messed up your life. And if, if not for you, you've seen other people go down those paths and you just know God is a better way to do life. They need to know why you think the things that you think, why you believe the things that you believe, and that you love them so much that it's important to you. You believe that it will benefit them too. You can't afford to assume that they understand all the decisions that they're going to be faced with and, and, the, and that they are making the right ones and choosing the right people. And if you're a teen in here, you probably don't want me to encourage your parents to do this, but be involved in your kids' lives and in their friendships. It, it, one of our prayers in our home for Casey and I is, to, is that, that God would give us the favor to be a home that all our kids' friends want to be at. Because we want to set the tone. We want to be the influence. We, 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 want, to be, we want to be the ones making the impact and not just leaving it up to chance. 
We, we want to be filled with the Spirit, and we were asking the Spirit to give us opportunity to share Him with our kids and with their friends so they can see what the life that Jesus intended for us was meant for, so we can model disciple-making and evangelism and the things that God has called us to. You can't afford to not be involved. Sit on the sidelines. You can't, can't afford, and this, is, this, this will move us into the meat of the sermon, you can't afford to assume that your view of God is accurate. You, you can't afford to assume that because God said it and I believe it and that settles it. You can't afford to assume that. You can't afford to assume that you understood what God was saying because that's a big part of what Jesus did in His ministry was He confounded the wisdom of the wise, the people who were sure they had Him figured out, He told, he told them, actually, the avenue you've been going on, is it's, it's a road that it's going to be hard for you to overcome. It's going to be like a camel fitting through the needle of the eye. It's not impossible. Anything's possible with God. But your view of God, you can't afford to just assume your view of God is accurate. The, that the way you think God is is the way He is. You constantly need to be submitting that to the Holy Spirit and to His Word and to, the, and to new revelation, to the teaching of, of people in, in books and from pulpits and in videos and, and, and then in prayer on your own saying, God, help me to test this. Help me to test the spirit of this thing, these things that I'm learning or that I've always assumed. And that, that's the key. The reason, I say that that's the, reason, the reason I say that that will lead us into the meat of this sermon is because that's the key to our passage in Matthew 25. In verse 24, we see the man who was cast or in, yeah, in verse 24, we see the man who was cast out saying, "I knew you were a hard man." I put the ESV up there because the literal translation of the Greek gives us a better picture of what's actually going on. It says, "Master, I knew you to be a hard man," which is a lot different than "I knew you were a hard man," because "I knew you were a hard man" seems to imply that he actually is one. But the actual translation is this young is this 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 servant saying I knew you to be a hard man so he's not describing what the master is actually like he's describing his personal experience his personal view his personal opinion and understanding of the master not necessarily the reality of the master and he calls him unfair he calls him difficult and unfair reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you did not scatter seed this is the linchpin of the whole passage because if you're launching, if you're trying to blast off in the new year, being filled with the Spirit and living as God has called you to live, if you're launching from a starting point that has inaccurate views about God and the way life works, you'll make inaccurate assumptions about yourself and your purpose and others and their purpose. When you plant the seed of assumption in the soil of ignorance, you reap a harvest of confusion. When you plant the seed of assumption in the soil of ignorance, you reap a harvest of confusion and you become a worthless servant. Verse 30. You become one who has cast out and everything taken from you, all of the richness of God lost because you assumed. How can you be a productive in your purpose on the basis of assumption? And this parable teaches us that we can't. You'll become unfit, unfruitful, and ultimately, and worst of all, unfaithful. So if we're going to blast off in this new year, we have to challenge some false assumptions. I don't know where this man got this assumption. What happened to him that he decided that the master is, is a hard man? Maybe it's possible that someone else gave him that impression, and I'll say one more thing about that. You have to watch out where you get your information about God from. There are all kinds of people declaring they know who God is. People who have not taken any time to know Him, really. Who have not invited God to know them and to speak into their life and, and show, show them and teach them a better way to live. Who have not even really experimented with His commands and His ways to see if He is good. They've just taken secondhand information from somebody else or they've taken something that's happened in this world or was perpetrated by somebody else, the example of somebody else without weighing it against who the, what the Master is really like, and they've decided that that's who the Master is. Often the systems and people representing God do not come close to God's reality. So be careful where you get your information about God from. 
Many times assumptions spring up from second-hand information. Here's what I do know, though, is that the man's experience, personal or second-hand, is not reality. And here's how I know this, because if you go back just one verse to verse 23, this is, this is the master's reply to the two previous servants. His master replied, well done, good and faithful servant. What a tyrant, right? <laughs> You've been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. That sounds like an impossible boss. Oh, you're doing a good job. I'll give you more of responsibility. Impossible. Come, come and share your master's happiness. Wow. I just, I, can you believe this guy? I don't, I don't think I can deal with that. Come, come and share in all that I have. I'm, I'm making it yours. You were trustworthy with it. So come and, come and share it with me. The reality of the master is not, does not fit the experience or the opinion of the of the worthless servant's idea of him. So you can't afford to assume what God is like because assumption leads to accusation and false exception so that you're blaming God or excusing yourself from things that are not true and not accurate. So I want to talk about six dangerous assumptions that we make. The first being the ability assumption. The ability assumption. In verse 15, it says... To, the, to one he gave five bags of gold, or five talents. To another two bags, and to another one bag, each according to his ability. The first thing I want to say to you is that God won't hold you accountable for what he doesn't give you. See, he looks at each of his servants, and he sees what they're capable of, and he entrusts them with no more than they're capable of, right? God does not give you more than you can bear. And he will not hold you accountable for more than he's entrusted to you, more than he's put on you. He'll not give you more than you can bear. And if he does, he will give you everything you need. He'll make himself available for training, empowerment, equipment to stand up under it or get out from under it, right? We've talked about this last summer. So each according to his ability, he assigned them responsibility. You're responsible for what God has given you. His grace is enough for you and you will be judged according to what? To, to the amount of grace that he's given you, that he's entrusted to you. Now, this doesn't mean that, God, that what God does through your life is not up to you. It doesn't mean just to do the best that you can with what you've got, and God will understand. I've heard it preached that way, right? Just do the best you can with what you've got, and God will understand. No, we're not, that's apathetic. That's an assumption. Just assuming, okay, God's given me this much, and that's all I can do, so you know, he'll just have to understand what I couldn't do. That's fatalism. <laughs> that, that's, that's, to, that's to believe that's to believe that that I can't control my fate, that I have no part to play in this. God, maybe, maybe this guy looks at God, the, the worthless servant, and he says, well, God only gave me one talent, so I guess that's all he wanted me to do, and I can't give anything else. I don't have the resources that, that person has, and so really, you know, why even try? Well, God, I'm just not good at that. The Lord, has given me these, the Lord has given, hasn't given me those gifts. Lord, if you'd just give me the opportunity of exposure, I would have done more. If you would have given me the resources, I would have done more. But I'm just a two-talent preacher. The five-talent person has more, ta more talent than the two-talent per person, so that's why they're fruitful. That's, that's why they do more than me with the church. That's why, that's why they're more effective. I'm just a two-talent preacher. I'll never have more than, more than 150 people. I can't, I can't disciple more than that. God's not giving me the gifts. They have more money as a church. They can hire staff. They can, do, they can do this. They can do that. So we're just... I've heard that mentality. I go to district functions and you'll hear people and they, it's like all these pastors start comparing themselves to one another, which we don't need to do because God has given each of us according to our ability at that point. And they say, oh, well, man, I wish I had that. If I had that... Here's the deal. Ability is something that you play a part in. Ability is something you play a part in. Because it doesn't say that they produced according to the master's choice, only that the master gave them certain abilities. It didn't say that the master determined how much they would produce. It just said he determined how much they, they could bear, how much they could be responsible for. You may not have an ability, but we all have the ability to grow the abilities we've been given. Don't we? We all have the ability to become better at what God's already given us. To be a good, a good steward 
with what we have. You may not have that ability or this ability, but you can grow the abilities that you do have so that you can work in other areas that normally you thought only would take this ability. I mean, imagine you have the gift of music and you think, I can't work with kids, but you have the gift of music. Do kids sing music? You don't have to work with kids to work with kids. You, you, can, you can model from the platform. You can go back there and you can play guitar with them. If, if you've got one gift, if you grow the ability, you can, you can teach a kid to play the guitar. Right? Landon, I don't, you, don't, you don't fancy yourself a children's pastor, but I do see you often with my boys, with Caroline, with a variety of people back there, giving them encouragement about how to keep rhythm on drums. If you grow your ability that God has given you, you'll have more influence and more opportunity. You're not required or, or accountable for the gifts you don't have, but you are accountable for what He has given you to multiply it. Jesus measures things by growth percentage, not raw numbers, right? Here we see that He doesn't give more blessing. He doesn't, he doesn't bless just the servant who brought back ten talents. He doesn't say, well, you did the best, so you get the, you get the blessing, nobody else. He gives the blessing to the two people that multiplied what was given them. God's looking at growth percentage. He wants you to multiply what He's given you. He, he said... He said in another, another place that a woman who gave two pennies gave the greatest gift, more than the people who gave $100, because she had given all she had. He was looking at percentages, not raw numbers. In this parable, the five-talent and the two-talent person received the same reward because they are equally fruitful. They both doubled what they'd been given. I love this. In, in Unqualified, Stephen Furtick says this. He says, we overestimate what we would do with the opportunity we don't have while underestimating what we could do with the opportunity we do have. We're always looking at the pasture on the other side of the fence and we think, if I was on that side of the fence, like Lot and Abraham, right? Lot and Abraham look and one side is clearly leaps and bounds better than the other and Lot says, I want that side of the fence. That's, that's where we can produce the most from. Abraham gives him the choice, even though he's the elder, because he knows I'll just be faithful with whatever God gives me because he's promised to bless me and produce from my life in abundance whatever I have. He puts his trust in what God can do with his faithfulness. And the Bible tells us that he, his, his livestock, his crops, his wealth is what multiplies more so than lots. Because he doesn't make the mistake of underestimating what he can do with what, he, what God has given him. He puts his trust in what God has given him. He doesn't make an assumption about abilities. Who has the best and what I can do with it. God has entrusted to you his mission, his treasure, opportunities to grow his kingdom and flourish in it. How much he gives you depends on how much you can handle, and how much you can handle depends on your desire to be faithful. So I want you to challenge the assumption that you can only do so much because in this story, it wasn't about the sum of what they produced as much as it was about the multiplication of what they've been given. If God wants to, I hear this all the time, if God wants to grow the church, He'll grow the church. Does God want to grow the church or not? Does He want to grow the church? Come on, people. Do you know this or not? Does God want to grow the church? No, so it's not. If God wants to grow the church, He'll grow the church. God wants to grow the church. The only question is, will we give all of what He's given us to that end? The only question is, will we take what He's given us and be faithful with it so that the church will grow? Because while He doesn't need it, He's chosen, He's willed it, that the only way His church will grow is if we do it. The perfect Lamb of God already demonstrated that. He didn't hang on the cross for any other reason. He saved you so that we could grow the church. It's not about whether God is able. That's not in question, is it? It's about whether we're able to accept what He's done and offer all of ourselves in the same way. Jesus said to His disciples, I've come to bring fire on the earth and how I wish it were already kindled. I've come to bring fire on the earth and how I wish it were already kindled. In another place, he says the kingdom of God is forcefully advancing for those who will take hold of it. So the question is, will you take hold of it? Will you receive the fire that he's brought? 
The Spirit of God living in you, producing Christ out of you. So how can you challenge yourself in the new year to make better use of the abilities God has given you? Secondly, the significance assumption. The text says that the man with one talent buried it because he was afraid. I wonder though, if it wasn't because he was a little bit offended too. Maybe not, but the parables are open-ended so we can entertain the possibility. The reason I'd ask you to is because I've seen people do this. He see, he's, maybe he watched the five-talent person get five talents. He watched a two-talent person get two talents. And then he gets one. And he looks down the line and he's like, really? Really? John, John Meadows got five talents. And I got one. That guy. Five talents. Landon Ramsey got two talents, and I got one. I mean, look at these guys. Come on. Man, it's not even worth trying if that's the order of things in this kingdom. I've just got one talent. I guess they can do it. They, you know what? You guys got it. John, Landon, you're in charge. Good luck. I'm not going to try, and you don't need me. The problem with this assumption is a one-talent servant may assume that they are insignificant relative to the position of others because they've compared themselves to others, but it ignores the value of what you have. It ignores the value of what you have. Anybody, I've said this on Wednesday night, so I'm testing you. Anybody know how much one talent is worth? Anybody? So roughly 17 years wages. So even one talent is half a life's work. That's what it amounts to. So this is not a small gift that this man has been given or this woman has been given. One talent is set. And, and the pessimist will be like, but yeah, that, but that guy got 85 years wages. He's not even going to live to work that long. That's not fair. <laughs> but you've been given a big gift. You've been given a lot to watch over. It's significant. The Master may have entrusted others with more, but He didn't skimp on blessings with you. Do you have breath in your lungs? Do you have a family to love? Do you have the opportunity to recreate a family to love? If, 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 if your family's failed you, if humans have failed you, do you still have the opportunity to choose the direction of your life? Everybody has been entrusted up front with at least one talent. With at least a large gift, 15 to 20 years wages, so to speak. God has given every person much. You can multiply it, or you can write it off as insignificant. You can say things like, oh, I don't really have much to say like that guy. I'm more of a listener. Well, guess what? That could prevent someone from committing suicide. There are all kinds of people who need someone to just listen to them, to take the pressure off, to let them believe that somebody loves them and cares about them. You may not be able to stand up front and get all the accolades and talk, but what you're doing behind the scenes applies what's being talked about up front. You may feel like everyone else is in a relationship or getting married or more successful with their family. Be thankful that you have time and freedom to give yourself to what God wants you to do right now if that's you. Be thankful, be thankful that you have a family you have the opportunity to multiply God's blessings into their lives. You can measure your significance by the opportunities you don't have or you can see the value of the opportunities that you do have. It's kind of like hummingbirds and buzzards. Talked about that before too, haven't we? Challenge the assumption that because it's not as much as theirs, it doesn't matter. What has God put in your life that you've been writing off as insignificant? Thirdly, the safety assumption. Believing it's safer to hide what the Master's given you than to use what the Master's given you. The Israelites made this mistake when they left Egypt and when they were about to enter Canaan. When they saw the sea in front of them and the army behind them, they said it would have been better to hide the Master's gift. In other words, it was better when we were slaves. We didn't want this freedom. It was better when we were slaves. And then they came to the Promised Land. They saw the signs of the blessing. Grapes as big as your face. I mean, it just described, it, it's truly a land flowing with milk and honey, just like God said. But then they said, you know what else though? There's giants in the land. We're pretty much there. This is a good place. Let's just stop here. We can't overtake these people. They're on the verge 
of the Master's happiness, all that He's promised them. And all but two people can only see the giants in the land. Only Joshua and Caleb remembered all that God had done and recognized that playing it safe was the dumbest thing they could do. You can settle for a safe spot in the desert or you can give it all to share in the Master's happiness. You can settle for a safe spot in the desert or you can give it all to share in the Master's happiness. It's the difference between David and the army of Israel when opposed by Goliath. It's a backwards way of thinking by the world's standards to believe that having less but living in God's will is better than to accumulate the most on one's own power. You can't afford to not give to God. You, you think, man, on paper, if I give to God, I will not be able to pay this bill, this bill, and this bill. And then I'll be homeless, and then what will I be able to give to God? That's the dumbest thing you can do in that situation. No offense, I'm not making light of your struggles. I'm just saying that what God says He will do if you trust Him is far greater than what you'll find in the desert of trying to make it on your own. Saul gives David the king's armor. He tells him to go out on man strength. And David says, you know what? This is just bogging me down. This is going to get me killed. So he throws off the armor and he goes armorless into battle with a giant with a sling as his only weapon. The important ingredient being the declaration that he made to Goliath. This battle is the Lord's. It's not mine. Now, every time I say that, I picture my son Joel pretending that in the living room. And he says, this battle is the Lord's! And Yeah! Preach it! It may seem counterintuitive, but in God's economy, it's counterintuitive to turtle up when in danger. The best thing to do is to march into battle knowing that the battle is the Lord's. The greatest danger for you is not that you will fail, it's that you'll be faithless. That's what David declared. He looked at Israelites' army and he says, what are you doing? We're the chosen people of God. This filthy sinner Philistine cannot stand against our God. Why are you sitting back here as if you have something to be afraid of? Maybe I will go out there and fail, but at least I'll be doing it the way that God, doing what God asked me to do. His greater fear is that he would be faithless. I'd rather step out as a church, launch a new ministry, a new service, a new campus, and have it totally implode, and God know that we care enough to try anything in the world to reach the world than to be faithless with what He's given us. I'd rather dare you to do something that seems pretty much impossible, which I'm going to do at the end of this service, and fail, than to just sit on our hands and just let come what may come. The man with one talent was afraid, and he assumed it was safe to hide it in the ground. So what gold is hidden in the ground among us? What has God given us that we've, we've hidden in the ground out of fear? It says, after a long time, the Master came back. So the hope that we have is it's not too late to dig it up and put it to work. So ask yourself that question. What am I hiding in the ground out of fear, out of weariness, out of false assumption? You can dig it up and put it to work. Fourthly, the urgency assumption. I need to have some urgency now to get done. This is not a man who stole or was fraudulent with his Master's money. He sat on it. We assume that urgency isn't a big deal. That there's always more time. But the difference between the one-talent person and the five-talent person is the man who received five bags of gold went at once and put his money to work and gained five bags more. If the five-talent person waits, maybe he procrastinates. Maybe there's a chance that it slips down the priority list and before you know it, the master's purpose is forgotten and the gold just sits. Faithful people know that things have to be done now. When God says, we go, I'm looking, who will go for me? Here am I, send me, I'll go. I'm ready, Lord. I don't know even what you're asking. You just said, go somewhere. Where, where, where do you want me to go? I'll, I'll go. Leonard Ravenhill said, the opportunity of a lifetime must be seized in the lifetime of the opportunity. I'll say this, the space between God's instruction and your obedience is the measure of your spiritual maturity. God will wait for you to figure it out. 
But the more mature you are in your faith, the quicker you will obey Him because you've learned, I can trust Him. I can trust Him. God's not a helicopter God. He's not going to make you do it. He's not going to hover over you like a helicopter parent. The Master entrusts His treasure to the servants and He leaves them for a long while. Maybe the one talent person intended to look back into it. He just buried it there while he thought about what he was going to do with it. But he didn't act right away and he got distracted and the Master's purpose and His will got buried beneath those good intentions. Ever heard that? Heard this quote, the road to hell is paved with good intentions? What distractions do you need to eliminate in your life so that you will respond to God more quickly? Fifthly, the maintenance assumption. The maintenance assumption. The, the one talent servant, he says to God, see, or he says to the master, he says, here, look, here's, here's what belongs to you. I've kept it for you. I've maintained it. And now I'll give it back to you. And in a way, I want to stick up for the one talent person when I read this, right? He didn't go and buy a lottery ticket or blow it shopping on Amazon. 17 years wages. Here, do what you want with it. I'm entrusting it to you. He brought back the master's money. He brought it all back. He maintained it. And my tendency to stick up for the servant comes from the confusion about the definition of faithfulness. Many of us are taught subconsciously that faithfulness is maintenance. However, true faithfulness is multiplication. True faithfulness is multiplication. I've said this board repeat, to the board repeatedly that uh, Barna surveys say that 2% of Christians, born-again believers, say that, that they've ever led somebody to the Lord. This is strong, but it's true. That's not faithfulness. That's not faithfulness. The last thing that Jesus said to His disciples is go into all the world and make disciples. Multiply. You're not faithful just in giving your life to Him. That's the starting point. That's the launch pad. In this new year, I'm calling you to blast off of that launch pad. You're faithful when you let Him use your life. When you actively serve Him by bringing others to Him through your time, talent, resources, energy, everything that God has given you. God expects a return. What is the first command that God gave those He made in His image? That God gave humans, you know? Be fruitful and multiply. Very first thing He said, and He's not just talking about making babies. Be fruitful and multiply. He says, I'm not looking for citizens who return to Me what, what I've already created and I could have taken with Me on My journey Myself and maintained it just as well as you did. I gave it to you for a reason. I've placed you where you're at for a reason to multiply. And you might say, you mean this temporary job that I really can't wait to get out of is a place that God has placed me to multiply? Yes. Wherever you find yourself, that's the literal translation of the Great Commission, as you are going, as you are going through life, make disciples. So whose life does your faith impact? In what ways could you multiply what God has given you and what God is teaching you? Our lack of multiplication is a sign of this last assumption. It's called the entitlement assumption. The entitlement assumption. Look at verse 29. Jesus, see, we, we assume that God is just going to give us based on our best efforts. That, you know, at the end of the day, He's going to be cool with, well, you know, I knew you to be a hard man. You didn't give me much. And Jesus turns that on its head. This is towards the end of his ministry. Up to this point, he's talked a lot of, or he's showed a lot about his love and grace. But now he's saying, you know what? Though this love and grace is a big gift, I'm giving you a lot. He says, for whoever has will be given more, and they will have an abundance. In other words, those who multiply, I'm going to give them more because they obviously are trustworthy with more. But whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. Whoever does not bring a return, they're not a citizen in my kingdom. In Jesus' story, He takes from the one who has not. We, we think that God will make the haves give to those of us who feel like we have not. We see this on every level of our society. And in the church, it looks like, well, that person has more time. That person has more strength. That person has more ability. That person has. That person has. God, take from them. Leave me alone. I can't. I won't. That's entitlement. To say that God has given you nothing. In Jesus' story, He takes from the one who 
thinks he has not, and gives to the one who multiplies. He takes his blessing and gives to the one who's multiplied. It's the master's money in verse 14, but in verse 16, it's the servant's money. Your gift comes from the master, but it's your responsibility. So this is how I'll close. Don't just assume possession. Assume responsibility. Don't just assume possession of God's grace. Assume responsibility for it. Don't just assume possession of His Spirit for yourself. Assume responsibility for His Spirit to others. Some of you have just assumed possession, but you haven't assumed responsibility. Or, you did at one time assume responsibility, but distractions have arisen, fears have over overshadowed, feelings of insignificance and lack about your abilities have creeped in, and instead of multiplying His grace, you're not just waiting for the Master to come back, or you're just waiting for the Master to come back so you can return it. You're just like, man, I just can't wait to get out of here. I understand that, but God calls us to something more. God calls us to something more. It's a false assumption about who He is and who you are and what He has or hasn't given you to do anything less. So the question is, are you trustworthy? Because maybe God trusts you more than you trust Him. In fact, I know it. I know God trusts us more than we trust Him. When He let His Son die on the cross while we were still sinners, He demonstrated once for all time He trusts us far more than we trust Him. Maybe you're waiting on the opportunity to come. A bonus, a raise, a platform. Some kind of improvement in your life. But God is just waiting on you to be trustworthy with what He's given you. To trust Him with what He's already given before He increases your opportunity. Maybe He wants you to get ready for the opportunity by being trustworthy with the little that you have. My dad's been in North Dakota for almost 14 years now. He's been faithful everywhere he's been. And I know that he struggled with at times. God, why am I still in this smaller church? I mean, I, I share the vision that you have and I keep running into these roadblocks and it seems like every time you want to do something big through the gifts you've given me, people get in the way. And yet, he continues to be faithful because he knows my job is not to worry about what other people do with what I share, but to trust that God is doing more with it than I could ever imagine. It's not to worry about what talents or how much He's given me. It's just to be responsible with what He's given me. Period. He's been an example to me. So let me tell you how I want to apply this today. I want to spend all of 2018 challenging our assumptions about what we're capable of as a people and as a body. We finished the year strong, right? We gave literally thousands of dollars in donations to, to the rescue mission, to Northeast Elementary. We've given away shoes and disaster relief. And, and one thing after another, you guys have been faithful with what God has given you. And it's been awesome to watch. And the excitement is tangible. But you know what else is tangible? Because this is what the enemy does to us. Whenever God starts doing something, he makes us tired. He makes us sick. And I feel like a lot of the things that we've been experiencing as a body from from the flu to random stomach bugs to bronchitis hitting everybody from, from grandma on down to baby Rhett is an attack. It's a spiritual attack. The enemy would like to get us get in the way of what God would want to do. And our temptation is to just assume, well, God, we had a good year. I'm going to take the first six months off before I get back in the saddle. I, let me just take a breath here. And God will make space for that. But He also wants you to get back in there as soon as possible. And I, I, I feel like it's part of my call and my job to make sure that we don't rest until God's kingdom is built in every corner of this place, of this community. So let me, let me tell you what's happened in your church leadership. You, you know, do you know now the problems that we have with our roof? The leaks? <laughs> and the mess that it's caused us. But we, we've, we've spent months of research on trying to figure out how to tackle that problem. It was happening long before I came here. 
And so we, we, what we found out, though, we basically we ended up back at square one after months of research. We found a good, good place, but they've got more work than they know what to do with, and we're small potatoes. So we're sitting in finance meeting, and the Holy Spirit shows up. How many times have you heard that? Holy Spirit, finance meeting. It, it doesn't happen very, it doesn't run through my mind very often. I mean, I asked that the Holy Spirit would come, but it just doesn't, doesn't feel like it very often. <laughs> doesn't mean he's not there. So we had a spirit-filled finance meeting, though. We're sitting here, and we're like, good grief. We've tried so hard. And this roof has been such a pain, and who knows what it's doing to the building as a whole. What are we going to do? And it just it came over the whole team all at once. It started with one person, and it just everybody just, yes, this seems good to the Spirit and to the Lord. You know what we need to do? Because, because what it might cost to fix the roof will severely hamper ministry to where we could, we could fix the roof but have an empty building and not reach a single person for, for years because we, can't, we don't have the resource to do it. And it became obvious, we need to pay off our debt. We've had this debt hanging over our head. We need to pay off our debt. In the interest of multiplying our ability to do ministry, in the interest of being free to multiply our gifts without the shadow of something the Bible is very clear we should not bind ourselves to. It's a new way of thinking, maybe, for some people. For a long time, it was assumed in our Western culture that debt's just the way we live. Dave Ramsey's been trying for quite a while to challenge those assumptions. In the interest of multiplying our ability to do ministry, we're going to pay off our debt. And then we started talking, then we started talking about it. We, we, we said, well, we've got about seven, seven and a half years left on our debt. So what are we talking about? I mean, it, how, how quickly do we want to do this? And it, 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 again, the Holy Spirit, two years. Two years we're going to pay our debt off. Two years. And the board agreed. We talked about it. And it, it was just obvious. Again, the Holy Spirit showed up. At, that time, at the time of that conversation, we owed right around $200,000. We've already, in three months, before even talking to you, paid almost $20,000 on principle because of gifts, that have unexpected gifts and resources that we had. We, we, had, we, had a, we had some money set aside, and then we received an unexpected gift just at the end of the year. So, so by, by next week, we will already have paid almost $20,000 on principle. On principle. Yeah, amen, right? So God is, I, I believe that God is getting out in front of this so that as I'm talking to you, you can hear God is in this. That, that, that this is not as big a risk as it might seem for you to consider how your family might get involved in this because God is trying to say, hey, I'm in this. And I, I went out in front of you to clear a path so you could see. Furthermore, just by nature of our payment, about 77% of our monthly payment goes on principle. About $2,000 a month goes on principle. So in two years, that's another four, almost $50,000 that would go on principle, which leaves us with right around $140,000 to pay off in two years. And, and the temptation would be to make assumptions about the size of our congregation, the number of families, the resources that we have, and look at that and think, that's crazy. And you know why I know that's a temptation? is because I've been living it for three months. I've been fearful, well, man, we just, we just did this initiative, and we're going to do the Christmas initiative, and then we're going to come on the, on the front side of 2018 after we just asked the church to raise $2,500 in three weeks and, and say, we're going to raise $140,000 in two years. God, are you crazy? Yes, I am, and I want you to be crazy for me too, right? I've been living in that for three months. I've been praying in that. I've been fasting in that. But I, I, know, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is in this. We, we've had new conversations about a variety of details where things didn't pan out quite the way we wanted to. And the peace that God gave me is, have I not shown you that I'm in this? So stop worrying about these little minutia and just take the step, okay? So you're probably saying, okay, Pastor, get to it. It's, after, it's afternoon. Tell me what you're asking. I want to propose that our church commit in 2018 and beyond to multiply 24-7. To be disciples that multiply. And, and that 24-7, I mean that literally, that all the time, that you'd be, you be open to God, waking you up in the middle of the night to pray and fast for a variety of reasons. That all the time you would be about His kingdom. 
But that also has significance for what I want to ask you to do as far as giving to this vision that God has given the finance team, the church board, and your pastor. Seven, seven, uh, we figured out if, if, we, if we can raise about $144,000, that'd be enough to pay off the debt. There's some other things. We still have the roof that we're thinking about. And so, and I wanted to, I was trying to think of something catchy. So I'm talking about seven categories that would raise $24,000 each. That would equate to $168,000, which would more than pay off our debt in two years. And it would give us some money to either search out the roof or search out a ministry or something that God wants us to do next. That we'd already be saying, God, look what you did in two years. We're ready to go for what's next. We're blasting off. We're not going to stop flying into the stratosphere of the Holy Spirit and His fire until you call us home. So, if 20 people or families will give $50 a month for the next two years, that's $24,000. If 10 families will give $100 a month for the next two years, that's $24,000. If eight families or persons will give $125 a month for the next two years, that's $24,000. If five persons will give $200 a month for the next two years, that's $24,000. If, if Four persons will give $250 a month for the next two years. That's $24,000. If two persons will give $500 a month for the next two years. Now, we're, now I'm getting into the stratosphere that I, only God can do in my mind. That's $24,000. If one person gives $1,000 a month for the next two years, that's $24,000 and $168,000 in two years and a mortgage-burning party and a celebration and uh, a surrender to God what do you want to do next? <laughs> but how, how can you use... And that's not all God is going to do among us as we do this. Do you, do you know... I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that we'll be tested. But if we're faithful in those tests, we'll see God break through with new blessings on the other side. I, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is just daring us to take the steps and not to worry about all the details. If we'll take the steps and just say, God, show me what you want me to do. I'm going to participate in this. I'm blasting off in the new year because Pastor Stephen's crazy, but it's kind of, I kind of like it because I think the Spirit might be in this. I know that God's going to pour out more blessings. And I'm excited to celebrate those every step of the way with you if we'll be faithful, if we'll stop making assumptions about what we can do because of what we have or we don't have or because what that guy got or what he didn't get, if we'll stop just sitting on our hands and we'll get off of our hind ends and we'll be, take what God has given us and put it to work, if we're faithful with a little, He will entrust us with more. If we multiply what we've, given, what, what we've been given, He will give us more. And so I want to challenge you in closing to trust Him as much as He trusts us. Next week, I'll have pledge cards. I'll also share with you how your board and your, your staff are participating in this. I won't tell you what each one's giving, but I'll tell you a total that's coming from your leadership because we're behind this. We're not, we're not coming to you and saying, well, you guys give and we'll, we'll make the decisions. We're going to lead the way. And we're going to ask you to join us in what the Holy Spirit has already begun in us so that we can continue to multiply God's kingdom into our community. So spend this week, pray. You may need to fast for a day, two days, three days. I would recommend it. I would recommend doing whatever you can so that, so that you can be sure in what God is asking you to do because I think He's going to ask you to go, go a little crazy and it's going to seem crazy to you. And it's going to scare you. And you need to know, okay, God, I'm giving all to you. I'm asking you to speak to me. I'm, I'm, I'm setting aside the thing. I'm setting aside food to, to seek you. I'm saying I'm hungry for you more than anything else. Tell me what you want me to do and I'll do it. Amen? So, I'm asking you to go this week and say, God, I want to trust you as much as you trust me. Holy Spirit, fill me so that I can live and be obedient in what you've asked me to do. Amen? Jesus, we just thank you for the opportunity to live in your grace, to build your kingdom. We thank you for the lives that have been impacted at Northeast Elementary, for this conversation that we have this week about what you might want to continue to do uh, through a partnership between us. So thank you for the rescue mission, for Pastor Ryan and, and his vision and, and the souls that have been saved at the rescue mission, for the souls we've seen saved here, the baptisms that have been carried out, the new members that we'll be bringing in. God, you're doing a new thing in us. And this seems, this seems huge to me. I'm just being really honest. 
But I declare you're greater than the things that I see in the world. I believe it. I'll put my trust in it. If you'll help me, Holy Spirit, fill me and help me to trust you. Fill us and help us to trust you. Help us to push aside our assumptions, to kick them in the teeth and send them back to where they belong and put our trust in you. To be faithful, to multiply what you've given us. Not just our money, but our time and our talents so that more might come to know you. More might enter relationship with you. More might be baptized into the body of believers. More might be equipped to multiply your glory, your presence, your grace through their lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.